I'm Simon Johnson. I'm a professor at MIT Sloan School of Management and a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. I was the chief economist of the International Monetary Fund through August of 2008. Uh, and when the, when the crisis broke really intensely in September, uh, James uh, Quark and I set up a, a blog, Baseline Scenario, where we followed the crisis, we wrote about what was happening, we made policy proposals, we did the kind of thing that I had done at the IMF, but in a completely open source, private sector way, for free, uh, over the web. And as we wrote, and as we were engaged in, in, in this analysis, the, we were quite horrified by, by how well tr the banks were being treated, and the bankers were being treated, despite the fact that they had messed up so massively. And, and it really came together for us in, in this meeting of 13 bankers at the White House in March of 2009. Um, and, and we felt that that meeting represented a lot of what had gone wrong with policy towards banks and, and more broadly it, in, in this country. Um, and, and we wrote the book really to try and urge people in Washington and more broadly to, to reconsider and to change that policy. This was a, a key moment. Obviously, the Obama administration had come in. They'd made some initial uh, announcements about how they would deal with the financial sector, but nothing had really come together very clearly. Nothing was really uh, believed in uh, very much by, by the markets. They pulled these bankers into the White House and, and they had at that point the government, the administration had the upper hand. They have, remember, the resources. They're the only people uh, with the resources to save the day in that kind of financial crisis. They can dictate the terms okay, completely. Now, you, you can argue that perhaps they shouldn't be too heavy-handed in this situation, um, but they erred completely on the other side, they said, you know, you will get to keep your banks complete as they currently exist. And everything about your belief system and your incentive system, I mean, everything that got us into trouble, remember, everything that caused this massive financial crisis will remain undisturbed, at least for the time being. Now, that, that's, that's, that's extraordinary. That, that is, I think, actually almost unprecedented in the history of financial crises. For a government to save the day so decisively, without conditions, without changing anything about the problems and the structures that have created the crisis. It, you know, it doesn't, it didn't make sense then, it doesn't make sense now, and it has created many problems that we have to deal with going forward. What they say is, we were scared of what would happen if we acted otherwise. Uh, we, what we point out in, in, in the book, in chapter two, is these very same people, these highly experienced very well qualified policymakers in the US had in the 1990s advised other countries who got into crisis to do something quite different. They were always on the side of saying, no, when you, as you seize the moment to turn around the economy and to prevent the crisis from getting worse, you must deal with some of the underlying structural problems. If you don't, then all your efforts of recovery will, will fail. All, all short term benefits will, will prove illusory. You will have more, more difficulty. Again, it's a very hard message to deliver but they delivered it repeatedly to other countries. They just couldn't apply it to the United States. Well, it is all about deregulation, some of which started, I would say, in the 1970s, but the Reagan revolution was really a big push for this. Reagan himself did not that make that much uh, progress, partly because the Congress was in Democratic hands. The big move, though, came in the 1990s when the Democrats uh, had the White House and, and the spirit of Congress, both in its more Democratic and its more Republican phases, was very pro-finance. So, there are many moments you can, you can point to, uh, particularly around the failure to, to regulate over-the-counter derivatives, which was a key decision made in 1998 uh, and 1999 and, and 2000. There was some legislation. That really tipped the whole thing over. But the, this process and this change has been building up for a considerable period of time. And that, of course, is going to, one of the things that makes it hard to address quickly and, and, and to uh, really deal with fast, because we're dealing with a, a problem that's built up over 30 years. Between the 1930s and, and the mid-1980s, uh, the banks were fairly well controlled. Uh, there were tight regulations. Uh, Glass-Steagall Act actually had, had some teeth and, and some bites, so commercial banks could not go too much into investment banking, more speculative activities, and, and, the, and the same was true the reverse as well. Um, so it really broke down. Th that was that a good 50 years. It broke down from, from, from the mid-1980s. We need to go back to that post-World War II period when, when banks were really held accountable. Well, there is, of course, reform legislation on, on the table. We think that could have gone in a much better direction. We think what is likely to happen will, will be largely meaningless in terms of uh, making the system 
less risky and addressing the too big to fail problem, the fact that these banks are just out, out of control. Um, so it, it will take legislation. This legislation almost certainly will not do it. We're just going to have to do it again. Well, I think we will see some con better protection for consumers, and that's, that's a good thing, and we, and we support that. But in terms of constraining the size, limiting the activities of these massive banks that are seen by the markets as too big to fail, and as a result have this huge unfair competitive advantage, they can borrow, by some estimates, 75, 80 basis points. That's 0 0.7, 0 0.8 of a percentage point cheaper than other banks can borrow. That's, that's a huge difference in, in today's market. Um, we think there will be nothing at all that will make a difference uh, to that perceived and, and, and probably true um, implicit government guarantee of banking those banks. At the heart of this problem is, is a set of people, not a huge set of people, and this is not anti-finance, uh, this is not anti-Wall uh, Street. I'm a professor of entrepreneurship. I like people who take risk and, and who put their own money and persuade other people to invest money in, in genuine risk-taking productivity enhancing technology transforming projects. Um, but there's this core of people who become very, very powerful, um, who can da do enormous damage to the rest of society. And, and honestly, they really don't care. Uh, they've made a lot of money uh, in the 2000s, for example. Some of them have written their, their memoirs. Many of them just you know, disappear with their hundreds of millions of dollars. And they leave it to the rest of us to clean it up. That, that's not acceptable. That's, that's not fair. That's not reasonable. That's not how we should organize uh, our society going forward. Other countries have many of the same problems. I think we should look to American history um, for the solutions. I think we should look at what Teddy Roosevelt did. He took on J.P. Morgan and he won. We should look at what FDR did. He turned the economy around without kowtowing to the bankers. We should look at what Andrew Jackson did. Andrew Jackson, very controversial figure, of course. He said the second bank of the United States in the 1830s was too powerful and it should be reined in. A lot of people thought that Jackson was, was out of control and, and exaggerating until the second bank of the United States started to fight back. And it showed its power, and, and it bribed a lot of people, and it, and it restricted credit in an attempt to um, stop Jackson. And that, of course, is what turned public opinion against them. People said, oh, my goodness, Andrew Jackson is right. That's why his picture's on the $20 bill. It's not a conspiracy. It's not an individual, it's not, it's not an individual financial firm, for example. It's a system. It's a system of beliefs and a system of incentives that caused a lot of trouble before and it now remains in place. And, and I would say it's, a, it's an ideology. It's a set of, really, people... In Washington, and I live in Washington, I interact with them every day. I argue this out. We have the blog where this, this goes on all, all the time. And the book is just really meant to reinforce and push these points further. But these people, these very, very powerful people, believe that finance is good, unregulated finance is better, and huge financial firms essentially unfettered in what they do around the world are the best. This is wrong. This is incorrect. I'm not a radical of left or right. I'm a centrist. I'm, I'm a IMF technocrat, if you like. I'm a professor. Uh, and, and we're bringing a lot of people with us on this point. We have a lot of blurbs in the book from people across the political spectrum. The structure we have right now is wrong. It is dangerous. It must be stopped. There is no value to the banks of their current size. If you, there, there is no evidence, and we go through this in, in, in the book, and we've debated this with all uh, the leading uh, people on the other side. There is no evidence that banks over $100 billion in scale confer benefits on, on society. Now, we're looking at banks that are $2 trillion, $2.5 trillion was the case of Citigroup b before the crisis. Uh, there's nothing in that society. Of course, there's bigger bonuses for the guys who work there and the guys who run it. But all society is getting is this big downside risk of these massive crises. Push them back to a couple hundred billion dollars. That's our, that's our point. And then you get plenty of benefits from the, from the scale. Um, and, and, and less danger. There's no conspiracy. Conspiracies, honestly, will be are relatively easy to root out and expose and, and, and fight against. This is not a conspiracy. This is a system of beliefs. This is the way people think. This is how, what they have come to convince themselves of. Because Wall Street did so well, because it made so much money, it became very prestigious, and a lot of people drank the Kool-Aid, if you like. A lot of people just believe this is the way it's got to be. And, and that's what we're fighting against. This book is, is, is a counter on, on, the, on, the, on the ideological, on the belief system. And, and you know, we have the evidence. We have the facts. We have a lot of people on, on our side. Oh, they've made it more likely. I mean, that's the point of keeping the bankers in place and keeping their entire incentives in place. Look, they weren't even embarrassed by what happened. Okay, maybe there was 20 minutes that it was a little bit awkward. But that's it. And, and these people, I can assure you, 
have no remorse. And as far as they're concerned, it was a great trade. They made a lot of money. Okay, that's what they care about, the bottom line. They did well out of this. Now make no mistake, they'll do it again. Secretary Geithner says crisis, this crisis of this kind only occur every 40 years. Uh, Hank Paulson, former Secretary of the Treasury, says they're every four to six years. Jamie Dimon, the head of J.P. Morgan Chase, says every five to seven years. Um, so this is a key issue. Our view is that the structure of the financial system has changed over the past 30 years so that these kind of crises now become more likely. And, and we think that the, mo the most obvious source of danger now is in emerging markets. People are convinced that China, for example, can only go up. Any investment there will make easy money, they tell you. There is a lot of savings coming from middle-income countries that come into U.S. And, and European banks and then come out again to those emerging markets, much like they did in the 1970s, a sort of a movement of capital around the world through our banks. It's all based on debt, it's, and it will be based, if people buy into this idea of the new boom in emerging markets, it will be based on unsustainable buildup of debt in, in, in those places, uh, probably around the private sector in, in, the, in their companies. And this will lead us into deep trouble not just in those countries, but also for our banks that are pushing the debt and selling the debt. So here we go again. And that's hard to say. The, the, the timing of the cycle we've seen recently would suggest it's a three to four to five year cycle we're in. Uh, but honestly, if, if it's 10 years or 12 years, and at the end of it, there's a cataclysmic collapse of the kind we just saw in 2008, 2009, that, that, that is something we should also be acting to, to prevent. You cannot do this every 10 years and, and with, without really horrible consequences for a lot of people in society. <laughs> I, I, I worry um, about the financial system and I, I worry that people are going to forget. You know, attention is, is hard to sustain, particularly these days. You get a lot of focused attention, that's an advantage of the internet, and people grab onto issues and, and, and I think People have been very worried about these massive banks, but it'll pass. Other, other things come up. The baseball season is just starting. Always, always a great distraction. Uh, many other, other issues will, will, will come to the fore and people will forget. And of course, that is exactly what these so-called masters of the universe in the financial system are, are counting on. As long as they can keep their positions and hold on to what they have, the public anger and, and the frustration will drift away and they can go back to doing what they were doing before. And, and that is really, very dangerous. That's dangerous to our democracy, frankly. That's what Thomas Jefferson said correctly at the beginning of the Republic. He said, fear the emergence of a financial aristocracy. And, and we've had a few episodes, we've had some fights with them along the way, and, and Jackson, Andrew Jackson won, Teddy Roosevelt won, FDR won. Now we have to do it again. But it's in a modern, we have to do a modern version, right? The world is more complex, attention is more fleeting, politics are different, campaign contributions are massive. The Supreme Court says they can give as much money as they want. This is going to be quite a fight. I'm an immigrant. Uh, I've been here 25 years. I became an American citizen. I, I, I thought about it long and hard, and I, and I studied. I studied for the test. I did well on the test, the citizenship test. Um, and and I, I believe in, in this American, American project. I think it has survived for 200 years for a reason. I think it's a republic that was well designed. And, while some of its structures, some of the initial language might seem anachronistic, it is actually a framework within which you can deal with big problems that come up. And one of the biggest problems is, because we're very innovative people, because we're very dynamic, and we build new things fast, and we allow new people to come to the fore, we also allow massive wealth to develop and a great deal of capture. At the end of the 19th century, the so-called Gilded Age, there was enormous income inequality in the United States, there were huge monopolies. And Teddy Roosevelt said it was out of control. He decided to take J.P. Morgan's railroad monopoly, it's called Northern Securities, to the Supreme Court. J.P. Morgan came to see him at the White House and he said, if we've done anything wrong, send your man to see my man and we'll fix it up. And Roosevelt said, no, we're gonna to go to the Supreme Court, we're gonna see this through. And he won, five to four. And from that came the antitrust movement. From that came the breakup of Standard Oil and all the other massive companies. Right? The consensus, the view we have, big is beautiful, big is high quality, big is great, does not apply to the financial sector. We need a new Teddy Roosevelt. We need political leadership that can take that message, build an alliance, seize the moment, and put us all on a path to a, to a better century.